welcome csir net life science aspirants to this short but comprehensive guide on one of the most revolutionary advancements in biotechnology that is recombinant dna technology recombinant dna technology has transformed the landscape of biological research and applications from genetically modified crops to life saving gene therapies the applications of recombinant dna technology are vast and varied thus understanding the principles of recombinant dna technology is essential for anyone pursuing a career in life sciences especially for exams like csir net life science examination so let's understand about this technique the recombinant dna technology emerged with the discovery of restriction enzymes in the year 1968 by swiss microbiologist werner aber the first recombinant dna molecules were generated in year 1973 by paul berg herbert boyer annie chang and stanley cohen of stanford university and university of california san francisco so what is recombinant dna technology This technique it involves altering of genetic material outside an organism to obtain enhanced and desired characteristics in living organism or as their products. So basically recombinant DNA technology it refers to use of sets of molecular techniques and restriction enzymes for recombining genes or regulatory sequences from different biosources and to make or construct recombinant dna molecule in vitro that is outside and living organism in laboratory and once this recombinant dna molecule is constructed it is transferred by several means into the cells where it may be expressed or cloned for specific purposes also recombinant dna technology is based on central dogma of molecular biology because of recombinant dna being transcribed into messenger rna and these messenger rna get translated into recombinant protein so once the recombinant dna is constructed we transform the cells we introduce these recombinant dna molecules into the competent cells where this recombinant dna is transcribed into messenger rna and these messenger rna are translated into recombinant protein expression of recombinant dna into novel protein is based on central dogma of molecular biology so now let's understand in detail how we can construct a recombinant dna molecule so construction of recombinant dna molecule involves joining together of dna molecule from different organisms so we'll take DNA molecule one DNA molecule from one organism and another DNA molecule from another organism and we'll join them with the help of enzyme so this recombinant DNA which is constructed we will insert it into the host organism host is the organism which harbors our recombinant DNA molecule it can be a plant cell animal cell bacterial cell or yeast cell now the question arises why do we want to construct this recombinant DNA molecule at a first place The reason is that these new combinations genetic combinations which are produced are of value to science medicine agriculture and industry like we are able to produce recombinant vaccines recombinant insulin recombinant growth hormones which are of value to medicine we are able to produce genetically modified crops pesticide resistance crops herbicide resistance crops and more which are of value to agriculture and even we are able to develop the products which are of value to food industry biotech industry and pharma industry so here in this figure you can see that how we can create a recombinant dna molecule so this is the organism from which one of the dna molecule is taken so for this we have to isolate the total genomic dna from this organism 
For example, let's say you want to develop the herbicide resistance trait in an organism. So in nature, we observe certain plants which show herbicide resistance. So as we all know that gene encodes for functional product. It's the genotype of an organism which determines the phenotype. So if a plant is showing herbicide resistance, it must be having the resistant gene for it. So we'll isolate the genomic DNA from that uh, organism, from that plant. Now we are not interested in total genomic DNA. We need only that DNA fragment with the gene of interest. So we'll perform the digestion of this total genomic DNA so that we'll get different fragments different uh, size DNA fragments and specifically the DNA fragment carrying a gene of interest we will isolate from other fragments by using either hybridization technique or PCR. Similarly, we need another DNA molecule which is called as vector. So, this another DNA molecule will be the vector or you can say a vehicle which will be carrying our gene of interest. So, this vector can be a plasmid it can be a cosmid, it can be a bacteriophage, it can be a artificial chromosome. So as shown in this figure, we have isolated a plasmid, a bacterial plasmid. So plasmid are extra chromosomal uh, self-replicating genetic materials present in the bacteria. So this plasmid will be acting as a vehicle or a vector. So this plasmid will open up by digesting it with the enzyme called as restriction enzyme. And then with the help of another enzyme called as DNA ligase, we will join this DNA fragment carrying a gene of interest to this vector, constructing a recombinant DNA molecule, which is also called as chimera. So this is the construction of recombinant DNA molecule. But the another step is we have to clone this recombinant DNA molecule as well. So when we talk about gene cloning, it involves cloning of a gene that is forming identical copies of a gene or a DNA molecule. So in gene cloning, the very first step is construction of recombinant DNA molecule. The next step is you will transport this recombinant DNA into the host cell. So as I mentioned earlier, host cell can be the plant cell, animal cell bacterial cell or yeast cell. So, host is basically the organism which harbors our recombinant DNA molecule. Now, in nature, there is a process called as transformation. So, it's a natural process where uh, exogenous gene is taken uh, by, the, by the bacteria in the environment. But in the laboratory, we can perform it artificially also by using physical, chemical and biological methods. So, transformation is performed. And you can see that this recombinant DNA molecule is introduced it into the introduced into the host cell. Now, inside the host cell, this recombinant DNA molecule will replicate and we'll get identical copies of this recombinant DNA, which we call them as clones. So, multiplication of recombinant DNA molecule occur in the host. And even like for example, if you are taking bacteria as a host cell. Then we know that bacteria divides through binary fission, the most common asexual mode of reproduction in bacteria. So when the bacteria divides through binary fission, each bacterial new daughter cell will have the multiple copies of this recombinant DNA molecule. And then, so numerous cell divisions results in resulting into the clones. And then even we can perform the selection or the screening to check whether these bacterial cells, they contain the, they are transformed or not, or they carry the desired recombinant DNA molecule or not. And inside the bacterial cell, the host cell with the desired recombinant DNA molecule, the gene will then be transcribed into messenger RNA. Messenger RNA can later be translated into the functional product and the gene will be expressed into the organism. So they, this is an overview of recombinant DNA technology and gene cloning. Kindly note in recombinant DNA technology, a lot of tools are needed and these tools are enzymes, vectors, host organisms and transformation methods. The enzymes used can be restriction enzymes which cleave DNA at specific site, the polymerase enzyme which helps to synthesize, Modifying enzymes which helps to modify DNA. So, these are speci specifically be needed when we are constructing a cDNA or genomic libraries. And ligase enzyme which is needed for joining two DNA molecules. So, let's have a look at these enzymes in detail. 
and then we will discuss about vectors, host organism and transformation methods as well. So I mentioned about restriction enzymes. Restriction enzymes are a very popular enzymes used in RDT. These enzymes they occur naturally and uh, has been identified in several bacteria. So bacteria use these enzymes as a defense natural uh, defense mechanism against the bacteriophages. So basically restriction enzymes belong to a larger class of enzyme called nucleases and specifically they are endonucleases. So nucleases are the enzymes which cleave the phosphodiester bond in a DNA molecule and uh, they can be of two type exo and endo. So exo they remove the nucleotides, they remove the terminal nucleotides in a DNA molecule but endonucleases are those enzymes which cleave within the DNA molecule. So endo means within. Now there are several uh, nuclease enzymes available but restriction enzymes they are different from other nuclease enzymes in the sense that they recognize specific base pair sequence in DNA and they cleave DNA within that sequence. That is they don't cut randomly within the DNA molecule. They recognize a specific base pair sequence like for example one of the restriction endonuclease is EcoR1 and uh, it recognizes this six base pair sequence that is GAATTC and you can see it cleaves within that DNA sequence. So it doesn't cut randomly and because it cleaves the DNA molecule restriction enzymes are also popularly called as molecular scissors and they have the recognition sequence of 4 to 6 base pair and usually the sequences are it's a palindromic sequences which can be read same from 5 prime to 3 prime in both the strands. So here if you read on this strand it is GAATTC on another strand also if you read 5 prime to 3 prime it is GAATTC. Then we have the polymerase enzymes. So polymerase enzyme is very much needed in replication. It has been used to synthesize a new DNA strand in 5 prime to 3 prime direction. So mainly the polymerase enzyme need a template, a primer because it cannot initiate the elongation of the strand. It cannot initiate the polymerization and elongate the strand and therefore it needs a primer and also it needs DNTP and magnesium as a cofactor. So here you can see the polymerase enzyme will bind and attach the DNTPs right and will elongate this strand. But we have other DNA polymerase also which are needed in RDT. One is DNA polymerase 1. The DNA polymerase 1, it only fill in nicks. Like here you can see some of the bases are missing. So this part is single stranded. So DNA polymerase 1 will add the DNTPs, but it will not stop. Like for example, here C is added complementary to G, A, complementary to T and so on. So only four bases need to be added here, right? But you can see that after adding the T, the reaction doesn't stop here. It replaces the existing nucleotides and add the new nucleotide. Because the DNA polymerase 1 has both polymerase and exonuclease activity. On the other hand, another type of enzyme is or you can say a polymerase enzyme is clinofragment. So this clinofragment is actually we get by performing the digestion of DNA polymerase 1 by mild protease. So we get two fragments, one is larger fragment and another is smaller fragment. So it's the larger fragment which is the clino fragment. Clino fragment has polymerase activity as well as the it has the exonuclease activity and exonuclease activity that it has is 3 prime to 5 prime. The smaller fragment has only exonuclease activity which is 5 prime to 3 prime. Now because clino fragment it lacks exonuclease activity 5 prime to 3 prime it will not replace the existing nucleotide. So even clino fragment is used to fill in the nick but it will not replace the existing nucleotide. Then another type of polymerase is reverse transcriptase it uses RNA as a template and it can synthesize a complementary DNA strand which we call it as cDNA. So mainly when we have to construct a cDNA library in that case reverse transcriptase is needed and one more polymerase enzyme is there which is TAC polymerase which is used in PCR. It is a thermostable polymerase. It can resist high temperature and it is isolated from bacteria living in hot springs like Thermus aquaticus. So we use it in PCR as it can resist high temperature. Then I mentioned about uh, modifying enzymes also. 
so dna modifying enzymes like we have alkaline phosphatase alkaline phosphatase enzyme it removes the phosphate group from 5 prime end so mainly we need this enzyme because when we are digesting the vector right like i told you uh, to construct a recombinant dna molecule we need a vector so if we isolate a plasmid we have to cut it open right we have to digest it we have to cleave it at one place now sometimes the vector can self ligate to itself because it has one end which has a 5 prime phosphate group and 3 prime oh group is there so it can self ligate to itself so if we remove the phosphate group from this 5 prime end the vector will not ligate self ligate so as i told you desired recombinant dna molecule we need if the vector self ligate to itself then in that case we are not we will not get the desired recombinant DNA molecule. So, we treat the vector with alkaline phosphatase so that this 5 prime phosphate group can be removed. And uh, then later on again, if we want to add the phosphate, we can use polynucleotide kinase, which work just opposite to that of alkaline phosphatase. So, here you can see polynucleotide kinase add the phosphate group at the 5 prime end. So, this is 5 prime end, this is 3 prime end, this is 5 prime end, this is 3 prime end. And one more enzyme is there called as terminal deoxynucleotidyl transferase. So, this enzyme it adds the DNTP but specifically only at 3 prime end. And you can add the DNTP in single, strand or single stranded DNA also and in double stranded DNA also. So, if you are adding it in single stranded DNA, so it will look like this. But if you are adding it in double stranded DNA, you can see it results into the cohesive ends, generation of cohesive ends. And even for creating the libraries, in that case also we need terminal deoxynucleotide transferase specifically in construction of cDNA library. And lastly, we have DNA ligase, which is the enzyme need to join nucleic acid molecules together. So mainly during the replication, like if any discontinuity remains, like here you can see phosphodiester bond is missing. So during the repair process, this DNA ligase is uh, will will repair it which form the phosphodiester bond. But in RDT, we need the ligase enzyme to join two DNA molecule where one DNA molecule will be carrying a gene of interest and another will be the vector. So, this is about the enzymes. Then I told you vectors are also needed in RDT. So, here you can see the table which shows, which summarizes the different vectors which we use in RDT. Vectors used can be a plasmid, it can be the bacteriophage like bacteriophage lambda or M13, it can be a cosmid. So, cosmid is basically a plasmid only to which bacteriophage lambda cos site is attached. Then some chromosomes uh, are constructed artificially in the laboratory also. So, they are basically plasmids only to which certain uh, important genes are being added. So, bacterial artificial chromosome is uh, based on natural occurring fertility plasmid and yeast artificial chromosome it is also a plasmid but to that certain genes are being added like centromere, telomere and ori that is origin of replication and then also we have mammalian artificial chromosome. Now choice of vector depends upon the host cell in which you are uh, introducing a recombinant DNA molecule because for example if you want to express a gene in yeast cell then you know that there is a difference in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cell so yeast is a simple eukaryotic cell and um, in yeast like they the the cell division happens and uh, certain enzymes are there which can degrade the recombinant dna molecule if you introduce it uh, inside the cell so therefore we need the genes for stability and for replication so that is why the choice of vector depends upon the host cell and also the insert capacity that is how much size of uh, gene you want to introduce it into the vector. So, every vector has a size limit of the insert like if you want to clone a gene of less than 10 kb you can use a plasmid but if you want to clone a gene of 35 to 45 kb then definitely you cannot use plasmid you need a cosmid. For back, the range, the size limit of insert is 150 to 300. For yak, it is 100 to 1000 kb, much more than back. And for mammalian artificial chromosome, it is much more than that. We have other artificial chromosomes also like, like we have TAC, we have PAC, right, and more.
So here I am giving you an example of vector PBR322 where P stands for plasmid and BR stands for Bolivar and Rodriguez, the two scientists who developed, uh, who constructed this vector and 322 is the, it's the number given like which is used to differentiate this plasmid from other plasmids developed in the laboratory. So PBR322 is one of the first vector to be developed and it is constructed in the laboratory like basically they it is based on natural occurring plasmids only so like uh, ampicillin resistant gene is taken from one of the natural occurring plasmid tetracycline resistant gene from another natural occurring plasmid or i from another natural occurring plasmid and then by using these genes we are constructing this pbr322 so here you can see this pbr322 it has a size uh, of 4.3 kb so ideally a vector should have a size of less than 10 kb so yes pbr322 has a size of less than 10 kb and it should have a selectable marker genes which can help in later screening or selection of the recombinant DNA molecule. So this PBR322 has ampicillin resistant gene and tetracycline resistant gene. It has origin of replication for replication and also it contains the restriction sites for restriction enzymes because we have to open up this vector, we have to digest this vector and introduce a gene of interest in it. So, for that we need the restriction enzyme recognition sites. So, here you can see SCA1, PVU1, PST1 restriction enzyme recognition sites are clustered in ampicillin resistant gene region. Then tetracycline resistant gene region contains recognition site for HIN3, BAMH1 and SAL1 restriction enzyme. This vector has a copy number of uh, 50 like it has a high copy number that means how many copies the copy number refers to the copies this vector can create in the host cell. So generally 15 molecules are present in transformed Listeria coli but we can increase this number up to 1000 or 3000 by adding the regulatory sequences. So here I would like to explain you that how we can create a recombinant DNA molecule. So this is our normal vector molecule. That is if I transform the host cell with this normal vector molecule, the bacteria will show resistance for ampicillin and tetracycline. Like if I grow that bacteria in a media containing these antibacterial agents, the bacteria will survive because the this vector will be this vector which is a plasmid PBR322 will provide resistance to the bacteria to survive in presence of antibacterial agent. So this is a normal non-recombinant vector molecule. Now let's say I introduce a DNA fragment with the gene of interest in this tetracycline resistant gene. So I perform the restriction digestion with BAMH1 and I introduce the gene of interest within this tetracycline resistant gene. So you can see that the, the gene sequence of tetracycline resistant gene is, is no longer same. In between I have inserted some DNA fragment which is in turn has its own DNA sequence. So this leads to inactivation of the gene. It leads to disruption of the gene. So now the tetracycline gene will be inactivated. So if I introduce this vector now, which is now recombinant into the host cell, the host cell will show resistance to ampicillin. Like if I grow this uh, host cell into a media containing ampicillin, the bacteria or the host cell will survive. Let's say our bacteria our host cell is bacteria so our host cell will survive because anti because the resistant gene for ampicillin is already there however since the tetracycline gene is inactivated now if we grow the host cell in the media containing tetracycline it will not survive because it has become sensitive to tetracycline so this is the difference between normal vector and recombinant pbr322 molecule then host organism, so I told you host organism, it harbors a recombinant DNA. Usually it's the Esterichia coli, yeast, animal and plant cell which can be used as a host. Esterichia coli, kindly note, is the most preferred host organism. The reason being it is easy to grow in the laboratory and also we use the non-pathogenic strains of Esterichia coli. So kindly note the host organism should be easy to cultivate in the laboratory. It should be easy to cultivate in the laboratory and also it should be non-pathogenic. So, Esterichia coli is a preferred host for gene cloning due to high efficiency of introduction of uh, DNA molecule into cell and also for protein production due to its rapid growth and ability to express proteins at very high levels. Then transformation method, so if you remember I told you that transformation is a natural process, it is one of the 
natural uh, process of horizontal gene transfer where the bacteria takes up exogenous DNA from the environment. But in the laboratory, we can perform the transformation by different means. So, we can say that transformation is of two types, natural and artificial, natural which occurs in nature. And in the laboratory, we can perform artificial transformation to introduce our recombinant DNA into host cell. So, we can use physical method, chemical or biological method. Physical transformation methods, it includes electroporation in which cells they are shocked with an electric current to create the holes in the bacterial membrane. So, recombinant DNA enters through these holes inside the cell. Then other physical transformation methods are biolistics, microinjection and more. Calcium phosphate and liposome are the chemical transformation methods. And biological transformation methods include use of bacterium like Acrobacterium tumefaciens and Acrobacterium rhizogenes to introduce recombinant DNA into the host cell. Now, once the recombinant DNA is constructed and host cell is transformed, so inside the host cell, the recombinant DNA will replicate and form multiple copies. So, the last step is screening or selection. So, selection is mainly done for two things. One, to check for whether transformation has occurred or not, that is whether our host cell is transformed or not. And second, to check for whether the host cell carries the desired recombinant DNA molecule or not. Because when we are performing the recombinant DNA technology, when we are constructing the recombinant DNA molecule, there is a possibility that instead of gene of interest being ligated to vector, vector can self-ligate to itself. And also there is a possibility that instead of a gene of interest, some other gene, undesired gene binds to the ligate to the vector. So, therefore, screening or selection is done mainly for two things. One for transformation, to check for transformation, whether host cell is transformed or not. And also to check for whether the host cell carries the desired recombinant DNA molecule or not. So, here I am taking an example of screening for PBR322 recombinants. As mentioned earlier, the normal vector, it has the restin gene for ampicillin and tetracycline. On the other hand, the recombinant vector, because of the gene introduced into tetracycline region, the tetracycline gene is inactivated. So, vector is no longer resistant to tetracycline, but it can confer resistance to ampicillin. So, here you all can see that we have three cells. First cell is without any plasmid, that is, this is the cell where transformation has not occurred. Second, you have the intact plasmid, that is the self-ligated vector is present in this uh, cell. So, this cell is transformed, but it does not carry the desired recombinant DNA molecule. It carries the vector which is self-ligated. And third is the cell which will be carrying our desired recombinant DNA molecule. Now, kindly note the cell, host cell with the self-ligated vector or the undesired recombinant DNA, it will replicate just as the desired just as the host cell carrying the desired recombinant DNA molecule. So, therefore, screening is very much needed. So, here three types of cells are there and we do not know which one is transformed or which one is non-transformed or which one is carrying our desired recombinant DNA molecule. Let us suppose this. So, when we grow these three cells in a media containing ampicillin, so you can see that only the cells Having the ampicillin resistant gene will survive. So, that means the cells with the intact plasmid and clone plasmid will survive. The cell which is not transformed will not survive because at the end it is the vector which is having the resistant genes for ampicillin. So, if, if the cell is not transformed, it will not have the vector and as a result it will not survive in the media having ampicillin. Only the transformants will produce the colonies. So, this way we have checked for transformants. Now, we will check for recombinant, the, the host cell carrying the desired recombinant DNA molecule. So, for this, we will perform replica plating. We will keep a wooden block on this Petri plate. So, this will be our master plate. And then this wooden block, we will place it on another uh, Petri plate. So, here you can see after incubating this plate, the colonies are formed. But some colonies are missing which were present in the master plate. So, basically, this plate contains the tetracycline. So, as we know that the normal vector, it will have the tetracycline resistant gene in it. 
but our recombinants are sensitive to the tetracycline. So non-recombinants will survive and grow. So the colonies that you see on this plate are of non-recombinant, whereas the recombinants which are tetracycline sensitive will not grow. So from the master plate, we can pick the colonies which were missing in this replica plate with tetracycline and we can grow them separately. So these are the cells with the PBR322 clone DNA inserts. Now for CSI and net aspirins, this topic is important because even you can expect many questions from this topic. The question can be directly on restriction enzyme or on vectors. So question can be statement based, question can be figure based. So here you can see a statement based question. A researcher attempted to clone two genes X and Y independently in a plasmid vector for overexpression and purification in Escherichia coli. All attempts to clone gene X were unsuccessful, whereas gene Y could be cloned easily. When the researcher attempted to clone gene X in the plasmid clone containing gene Y, gene X could be cloned. So the following statements were proposed to explain the above results. So four statements are given and you have to find out that which one of the following options represents a combination of correct statement to explain the observations. So this is an experimental based question. And to answer such question, you have to read the question carefully. You have to focus on what information, what detail is given. And based on that, you have to then go through each statement one by one. And you have to find out which statements are correct. So let's go through statement A, B, C and D. So statement A is that protein encoded by gene Y is not lethal to the cell. So as mentioned in the question, the researcher attempted to clone two genes X and Y independently in a plasmid vector for overexpression and purification in Escherichia coli. And the attempts to clone gene X were unsuccessful, whereas gene Y could be cloned easily. So this statement A is correct because it is mentioned that gene Y could be cloned easily and this is only possible when the protein encoded by gene Y is not lethal to the cell. So this statement A is correct. Then gene X, statement B is gene X has introns which prevents its expression in Escherichia coli. So if this would have been the case, then in that case, if when we were cloning the gene X in the plasmid containing gene Y, we are observing that gene X could be cloned. So this statement is incorrect. Then statement C is expression of X protein is lethal to the cell. So this statement is also correct. The reason is that it is mentioned in the question that all attempts to clone gene X were unsuccessful. So this is only possible when expression of the X protein is lethal to the cell. So this is correct statement C. And statement D is that Y gene product inhibits the activity of X protein. So statement D is also Correct, because it is mentioned that when the researcher attempted to clone gene in the plasmid clone containing Y, earlier gene X, cloning of gene X was unsuccessful. But when we are cloning the gene X, when the researcher attempted to clone gene X in the plasmid clone containing gene Y, it could be cloned. So this is only possible when Y gene product inhibits the activity of the X protein. The answer is option 4 because A, C and D statement is mentioned in option 4. So lastly, let's know about the role of recombinant DNA technology to improve human life. In the past century, recombinant DNA technology was just an imagination that desirable characteristics can be improved in the living bodies by controlling the expression of target genes. However, in recent era, this field has demonstrated unique impacts in bringing advancements in human life. By virtue of this technology, crucial proteins required for health problems and dietary purposes can be produced safely, affordably and sufficiently. And this technology has multidisciplinary applications and potential to deal with important aspects of life. For example, in medicine, we are able to generate recombinant insulin, growth hormones, growth factors, interferons, interleukins, recombinant vaccines, antibiotics. Even we are in diagnosis, we are able to 
with the help of recombinant DNA technology, we are able to identify the gene responsible for human diseases. And moreover, recombinant pharmaceuticals are now being used confidently and rapidly, attaining commercial approvals. Then in agriculture, so particularly in agriculture, genetically modified plants, they have been developed. So they have uh, augmented resistance to harmful agents. They are being uh, modified to enhanced product yield and show increased adaptability for better survival. Then in forensic sciences, the application of recombinant DNA technology in forensic sciences, uh, it also depends on the techniques uh, called DNA profiling or DNA fingerprinting. So with the help of uh, recombinant DNA technology, it is now possible to investigate crime suspects, paternity testing, studying kinship and even sex identification. Then in energy applications also, recombinant DNA technology plays an important role. So there are several microorganisms, uh, especially cyanobacteria. which can mediate hydrogen production, which is environmental friendly energy source. So cyanobacteria can be engineered using recombinant DNA technology to make them able to convert carbon dioxide into reduced fuel compounds. And in archaeology, recombinant DNA technology can be used to study origins of modern humans and also used to study prehistoric human migrations. So to summarize, recombinant DNA technology is a powerful tool that allows scientists to manipulate DNA for various purposes with wide-ranging applications in agriculture, medicine, forensic science, energy applications and beyond. So to all the CSI and net life science aspirants out there, dive deep into the world of recombinant DNA technology. It's not just a subject. It's a gateway to endless possibility in the realm of biotechnology. I hope you like this video. Thank you.